Holdness, welcome. This is Josh Dippold. And today I've got Justin Otto with me. Justin, what's going on? Uh, not much, man. You know, just uh, living life. Yes. So who is Justin Otto? What does he do? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Justin, Justin's been many things, right? Like, uh, you know, we talk about reincarnation and I, God, I've lived so many different lives over over the course of this one, uh, I guess we could call it blanket incarnation, but man, I've been, uh, a touring musician, um, a recovering heroin addict. Um, I guess, uh, I guess you would call myself a meditation teacher of sorts. Um, I don't know. I'm not empowered by any means, but, uh, I, I working on that, right. Maybe one day, <laughs> uh, I'm just, just a, just a dude, man. Just, I'm just here. <laughs> Well, that's cool. You uh, host a, a podcast of your own, and it will, we'll yeah. maybe talk about that at the end. But, you know, mm -hmm. a, f a few things that we, we connect is we're both big um, meditation uh, heads, I would say. You know, uh, we're both Absolutely. familiar with Dhamma. And so tell, um, what got you into all this? I mean, I guess this kind of base program story, you know, uh, heroin, uh, and, uh, Dhamma, you know, w what's that all about? You know, how did you, or what's worth uh, mentioning about this, you know? So I guess my, and then this is the answer I always give when I'm asked that question, you know, what brought you to the path? What brought you to meditation? Uh, I think it's the same thing that brings everybody to the path and brings everybody to meditation and, uh, initially, uh, for the most part anyway, and that it's suffering, you know? Uh, I was, I found myself, uh, in jail. I was like, like I said, I was, I was a heroin user, um, at the time. And, uh, this guy that I was buying drugs from ended up getting arrested and he kind of just gave up everybody that he was selling to. Uh, and we all kind of got charged with what he got charged with, uh, under the blanket of a conspiracy charge. And so I was charged with conspiracy to traffic heroin over 28 grams, but less than 30 kilograms. Uh, which I absolutely wasn't guilty of. Um, I was not a heroin trafficker. If I was a heroin trafficker, I might have been able to afford my bond, but <laughs> I was not. Um, I was just uh, simply a junkie at the time. And I found myself in jail with no bond. Um, and I was losing my whole mind. <laughs> and I was just kind of bored in there. I was at a actually at a work camp. And so we would go out and work during the day and then have kind of the evenings to to do whatever. And uh, I was just kind of looking on the bookshelf one day, and this is back in 2014. Uh, and I kind of dabbled with meditation here and there before, not really seriously at all. But I found a book on a bookshelf called uh, We're All Doing Time by Bo Lozoff. And he was kind of, uh, he was friends with Ram Dass, and it was part of the, uh, the book was released as part of the Prison Ashram Project. And the whole point of the book was kind of like, treat this time while you're incarcerated like, like the, the facility is your, your ashram or your monastery. And it gave some basic, um, you know, like mindfulness of breathing techniques and uh, some simple yoga asanas and stuff. And I was like, well, it seems like a pretty wise way to spend my time rather than getting wrapped up in all of the, the jail type stuff, the play in the cards and the, you know, whatever else was going on. So uh, that's what I did, man. I just started started sitting and I just started, you know, started really small with like five minutes here and five minutes there, 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes. And it just kind of gradually grew. And it was a, it was an interesting place to really get introduced to the practice because I don't know if you know this, but jail is not exactly the most, like the quietest place in the world. Uh, so, uh, it really like right from the jump, it, it really kind of strengthened my practice, just having to, to learn how to sit amongst the chaos. And, uh, but that's, that's what got me on the path, man. It was, a uh, was meditation, um, all because of that book. And, uh, I can really thank Ram Dass for that. And, uh, for the longest time, it was just meditation. Like I really didn't know. I mean, I knew, you know, some basic stuff about Buddhism. I had heard of the Four Noble Truths and things like that, but I didn't really have any, any groundwork or any like framework for what the Dhamma was at that point. And so I got out of jail and didn't really, meditation was great. It was a, a good way to distract myself at the time, but that's all it really was for me in that moment was a distraction. It was a way to, to kind of tune, you know, turn the volume down on the thoughts a little bit, but I didn't really take too much away from it. it and I, I continued meditating, but I also continued using drugs because there wasn't a whole lot of healing in jail. Uh, and it wasn't really until, I don't know, maybe 
2016 or so, a couple of years later, that I really started investigating more about the actual practice and really getting into into the Dhamma itself. And, uh, and you know, the rest is kind of history. Here we are. <laughs> well, cool. I want to jump into some details um, in jail if, if, uh, if you're up for yeah. it. I mean, sure. uh, and then, well, first the trumped up charges. I mean, that's just, you caught a really weird break there it sounds like you know uh i don't know if you'll ever it, it, i mean what good that will do finding out what uh, went around i mean did you think about revenge at a certain point where you like in a grief state you know bargaining or wanting to to, to negotiate or find something out change something you know, was there ever like this why me or you know this classic thing you hear about jail oh i'm, I'm innocent well or then you know this this type of thing or it sounds like you're pretty level-headed right about okay admitting this but this was i mean crazy shenanigans going on so i guess we can start there and then i want to just talk about the actual environment i mean i've got a friend who's actually a old high school buddy i haven't talked to him in quite a while though but he's a he's a guard at a, at a high security prison in illinois and he's told me some crazy stories there but like how big was the cell you know did you sit on the bunk is there a chair in there did you have a bunk mate you know um like uh, yeah so in, like what were the long you said you started with five minutes how long did you did you get you know um and was there a, a, a dharma prison program because you hear about this famous zen center uh or san francisco zen center in like san quentin and uh had a dharma friend uh uh, Denny K. Mueller used to do a show with, and he was involved in that for a while. Uh, but I know that's a right. huge program and I don't know too much about it. So that's plenty enough to throw out there for now. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I guess we'll just begin with the experience itself. And, and yeah, of course there was a, there was a lot of like, why me, you know, how could this happen to me? And, and, uh, and the, you know, there was some, I guess at the time there was some, oh, you know, I'm innocent. But the more I sat and I thought about it, the more I really looked at it, it was like, yeah, well, I'm not guilty of the thing I'm charged with, but I'm definitely guilty of using drugs. And at least at that time, and still, you know, that's pretty much illegal. So I, I, I was kind of in the right place, you know, like, honestly, I should have been there. Um, I ended up actually pleading out to a, a possession charge, even though I had no, no drugs or any drug equipment on me at the time. I ended up pleading out to that and, and, and actually ended up doing a, a year in jail. And so, you know, and like I said, man, I, I just used that time as wisely as possible and really tried to just cultivate this meditation practice. Um, it started, you know, like I said, five minutes and that kind of evolved into 10 and it just gradually built and it got to the point where I could sit for an hour at a time in there. Um, I did have a bunk mate. It was kind of an open dorm. So we were, we were separated into two separate dorms and it was kind of, you could, you know, flow freely throughout the place. But, uh, I, I did have a bunk mate. I was, I had the, the top bunk at the time. So I would, uh, sit on my top bunk and, and just, uh, just meditate. And, uh, people thought I was crazy <laughs> because I wasn't, you know, getting into all the stuff that everybody else was getting into at the time. And, but, uh, yeah. And what was your other question? That that was pretty much uh, it, except for now I'm forgetting too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, no, you you pretty much the 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 bunk mate and stuff. So I want to jump into the um, psychology of addiction. Um, now, have you sure. what what have you learned about this? I mean, um, it, it, I I'll I'll spare you my insights too, unless something comes up from what you don't mention. You know. And, uh, yeah. So like what goes on well, in the mind of a junkie and, um, and before, before we get into this, I want to say, yes, you know, it's, it's understandable how much pain, uh, that the, the human condition has in life, you know, and it's this, you know, uh, there's so many different views on how, uh, we should go about, um, substances in our society, you know, and there's a lot of varying opinions and I see pros and cons to a lot of these different ideas. And so I'm open to hearing about yours too, but definitely into the psychology of addiction okay um well i i think i've actually remembered your last question before we move into that one uh no there was no dama prison program here um there there still isn't this is i'm i'm in the gulf coast of florida uh in the northern part of florida we're like deeply in the bible belt and um not a lot of that going on here i'm actually uh in the process of trying to work with the the at least the, the local jails here and try to bring 
uh, meditation to the jails in, in a more formal way and to go in and actually teach some of these techniques to some of the guys in there because, as you know, it helped me so much while I was in there and it really ultimately ended up changing my life. Um, to move on to your next question, um, addiction. So I have r- rather kind of an interesting story, I would say. Um, I came by addiction uh, in a way that really wasn't my fault. Uh, so I'm a childhood cancer survivor. Uh, when I was 13, I was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, um, which that was a uh, kind of a lot to handle for a 13 year old. Right. Um, then this was before I had ever smoked a joint. This was before I had ever had a drink. This is before I had ever done any of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, one day I'm at school and then I start just kind of feeling ill. I'm waking up. My, I'm having nosebleeds. I lost like 40 pounds in two weeks. And I'm like, yo, mom, something is seriously wrong. And uh, at first she kind of thought I was faking because I'm 13 and you know, every 13 year old's looking for a way to get out of school. Um, it turns out I was not faking. <laughs> I would go to the the nurse, the school nurse every day and like throw up and, you know, just be in there and like, I, I got to go home. And, uh, this went on for a couple of weeks until finally we went to, uh, I got taken to an oncologist and he was like, yeah, you've uh, got cancer. And from that point I went straight from that doctor's office to the hospital and didn't go back home for probably three months. Uh, but while I was going through treatment, I was on a morphine drip with uh, Demerol injections several times a day. And so here I am going through probably the most traumatic experience of my life at that point. And the only thing that they can give me that provides any sense of relief is IV opiates. Um, Fast forward to, um, say, 2012. Um, At the time, I was uh, married. Uh, My my wife at the time um, had a a daughter, assuming she still does, <laughs> but, um, we, I, I become very, very close with her daughter and, uh, you know, I, because of the, the cancer treatment, I can't have children of my own. Um, so, you know, I kind of took her in as my own and raised her as my own for three, four years. And then we ended up separating and that loss hit me really hard. Um, I just didn't know how to deal with it. And so I, I had already been kind of drinking a little too much at the time. Um, and then that just kind of evolved into, into using, I was using pills at first, you know, just, uh, insulfating them, snorting like Roxy's or some such ilk. And then, uh, met a girl after we had separated who just happened to be an IV user. And I was like, Oh, I'm kind of curious about that. You know, curiosity killed the cat. I was, uh, really into, you know, all the old beat generation writers like Burroughs and all that stuff. And they kind of romanticized that shit a little bit. And, and, <laughs> and so like, you know, curiosity got the best of me. And as soon as I did it, like the, the first time I did it recreationally, it was like that feeling that from when I was 13, it was like, Oh, there it is. Right. Like that's that feeling that I've been looking for. There's that sense of relief. There it is. And it was just like, you know, I tell everybody it felt like coming home in a sense, you know, um, Addiction for me, and I, I can only speak from my own experience because that's all I have. I can't speak for anybody else and why they get addicted to things. But for me, it was just an attempt to to turn the volume down on the pain, you know, just the pain of living, the pain, and to, you know, to use Dhamma terms, the pain of existing in samsara. And it did a really good job of that until it didn't. You know, drugs are great for that. They work really, really well in the short term. In the long term, they don't work out so well. And that's kind of what happened to me. Uh, but yeah, ultimately what brought me to to drugs was the same thing that brought me to Dama was suffering, man. Wow. Yeah. And it, you're right. The vast majority of folks that I meet, they come through the, the Duca door, you know, I, I know I certainly did. And uh, I mean, of course I, I've met uh, scholars and stuff where it's, it doesn't seem that like the case, although I haven't really asked them, but wow, man, what a, uh, a journey. And it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Um, other than uh, I liked your transition here about the Dhamma. So, um, tell folks a little about what you're studying and practicing, um, mostly in the Theravada, right? Uh, mostly, mostly. So like, you know, even, even if we look at the, and this is kind of where I'm at lately is like, even if, if we look at, the Theravada, like really the Theravada is based off of some of the commentaries, like the, like the Vasudhi Maga and things of that nature. And, and really what I've been doing lately is just going back to the, to the Pali Canon, like as far back to the oldest texts as we can. And like, what, you know, what did the Buddha actually have to say? 
you know, what was what was his take on things? And and it's it's really given me a, an interesting perspective. And not that I don't love the Theravada, because that is, if I had to claim a lineage, that would be the one that I would claim. Um, just because I feel like that's the the teachings most closely associated with what the Buddha was teaching at the time. Um, and that's, again, not to discount any other forms of Buddhism. That's not to discount the Mahayana or the, or the Vajrayana, any of the Tibetan practice, any, any of that stuff. They're all wonderful. They're all beautiful and, and props to them for doing what they're doing. Um, for me, I just, something about the Pali Canon and the, just the, the Theravada really resonated more with me. It just seemed like the most practical to me in a sense, you know, it's not quite as esoteric as some of the other stuff. And, uh, it just, it, it's what worked for me. It's what clicked. Um, I, uh, in, I guess I really got into that through, uh, through some really good teachers, honestly. Right on. Yeah. And I could say the same thing, you know, I'm, I'm interested in all the different schools and I don't really consider myself a Buddhist, but I have, you know, the suttas, it's yeah, just it's so, <laughs> so profound how the Buddha had a, a knack to, he could just reach anybody on their level, you know, and have a teaching right. for them. And if we, if we can, can kind of trace back from what we're told, uh, it seems like the closest to what we know as the historical figure of the Buddha. You know, there's all kinds of uh, issues. I won't go into scholarly things that I have questions on. I've, I've done that on my site before, but as far as what we have originally, and then like you say, I mean, whatever I'm from the scholarly, but you, you sit there and you read that and it's just profound insights into life and the vast amount of knowledge uh, that he had, but then limiting it to just these two things we're talking, you know, suffering suffering and the end of suffering and um, right. how, you know, same could save beings lifetimes of the uh, study by what he um, put forth and, and, and handed down. So yeah, props to the Buddha yeah. big time. <laughs> the, the, the you one know what's this, interesting like, to me is, uh, mm -hmm. what, you know, what's interesting to me is I, I, I teach a, uh, a meditation class, you know, and basically I'll give a, a Dharma talk every week. And uh, so it kind of, it really keeps me involved and really keeps me in the suttas and keeps my practice pretty strong, I would say. But the thing that always, uh, always makes me kind of giggle a little bit is invariably every, every week, someone's like, Oh, that, that was exactly what I needed to hear right now. It's like, yeah, it always is. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're, we're talking about right now is the Buddha just had this way of like, it's the human condition hasn't changed any, you know? Even though he was Siddhartha Gautama was alive twenty six hundred years ago, the human condition hasn't changed. the The surroundings have, you know, life has changed a little bit. The way we live our life has changed a little bit, but the things we go through as people that hasn't changed not not one bit. Yeah, the 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 roots, you know, the 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 greed, the ill will, the ignorance, or the the delusion into those, and that's that's the big issue right there. And then. Yeah, the dukkha, I mean, however we want to translate that suffering, you know, is a really harsh term in Western circles a lot of times for some people, but right. stress, you know, unsatisfactoriness, I mean, like this not, not okayness yeah. or something's just a little bit off, having a bumpy yeah. ride, a hard way of going. Yeah, well, you, know, you want to hear something really interesting? Sure. I found this pretty fascinating. So uh, dukkha is actually this compound word of do and ka. And if we really break it down, it's just difficult, empty. Difficult That's empty. Really See, good. I've heard some people say it's a, uh, what is it? Su, uh, uh, dang it, I had this. Um, uh, Difficult, empty. Yeah, because that's the big thing, too, when you hear about addictions as well. There seems to be this huge something missing, right? This huge gap that right. trying to fill with something. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be addictions, too. But, yeah, how right. can we be okay in that with that huge gap, you know? And, right. and then the, you got some people that go to the other side. No, oh, life is beautiful all the time and, and do this perceptual shift where, you know, I'm not saying it's not helpful a lot of times, but kind of denying that there's um, crap in the world, you know, or right. all yeah, these different I strategies to deal yeah. with. And I think, and we forget it's the noble truth of suffering, right? And it's, I, I'll, I'll get off the soapbox here, but uh, in, in this no, notion of truth is really important to me too. So, yeah. Well, you know, like we can really look at the four noble truths. And, and I think what the Buddha was really saying is like, these aren't really capital T truths, like things to believe, right? Like these are things to experience. These are things to do. So within the first truth well like so let's break it down a little bit like the buddha didn't really teach cause and effect 
the Buddha taught interdependence. And, the, you know, the, we often hear that, you know, craving is the cause of suffering. Um, maybe, maybe. I think that suffering is the cause of craving. And then that leads to further craving, right? Which causes more suffering. I think it's a cyclical thing. So it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because suffering's going to be there. You know, did I get cancer because I craved it? You know, did I suffer because... <laughs> You, you see what I'm saying? Like this, the suffering is just in, it's woven into the fabric of existence. That's what it is. It's going to be there. It's like, what do we do with it? And in the first noble truth, we're asked to embrace suffering. You know, there's, there's this term dukkha perinya, may dukkha be fully known and embraced. And that's what we're asked to do. We're not asked to get rid of dukkha. We're asked to embrace it. Well, Yes, I would say we're, we're, we're asked to embrace it in service to the second, third, and fourth noble truth, though, right? Correct. Not to, yeah, not to deny it, pretend it's not there, and just kind of no, put my head in the sand, moment. right? Exactly. But it's not to have a pity party, you know, it, no, it's not, not to to amplify it and keep it going. Right. Yeah. You know, right. it's, uh, that's just, so then the third, that's an easy truth, trap to fall in. That's an easy yeah, chapter to follow. You get stuck in, you, I, and I was that way for a long time. I was a very, a very what I would call a first noble truther, right? Uh, when we forget about, you know, that there is a cessation of suffering. This word naroda, right? You know, yeah. there is this cessation of suffering. There is this higher happiness. And I used to be one of those people. Um, well, maybe not so much, but you know, you do hear people they get really lost in that, and and it, they kind of gloss over it, but I, you know, and I, I don't know, I, you know, you said earlier, you don't really consider yourself a Buddhist and I don't really consider myself a Buddhist either. If anything, I'm a Dhamma practitioner. That's what I am. And, and, uh, and I take a little bit from, uh, other, other paths as well. You know, like, uh, there's things about the, the, the Hindu path that I, that I appreciate. There's things about Christianity that I appreciate and they're all teaching roughly the same thing. And that's love, right? So if we get down to the core of it, it's all just, it's love and just being good to each other. And that's, that's the end goal, right? Like that is the cessation of suffering. You know, the Brahma Viharas will take us really, really far, you know, that uh, the, the, the sublime abodes, the sublime dwelling spots, you know, what are we living in? You know, are we living in self pity? Are we living in, you know, instant gratification, um, right. technocracy or transhumanism, you know, where, where we dwell, where are we living, where are our hearts dwelling and these four immeasurables, you know, they're just, to me, I haven't really found any other place better than those places to dwell. You know, I haven't found any place better to dwell than the, the Brahma Viharas. Um, yeah. Right. So who are your teachers? You know, what, um, who have you studied under? Um, are you looking, um, what teachers are, have you sought everybody out that you wanted to seek out so far? You know, um, you know, so the, uh, my, my teachers, uh, the ones that too. I've worked the most closely with are uh, uh, Mikey Noshel uh, and Andrew Chapman, and they're in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. They are um, out of a Wild Heart Meditation Center, which I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Against the Stream and uh, Noah Levine. It used to be a branch of Against the Stream uh, before all that kind of stuff happened with Noah, and they kind of went their own way. Um, and that's mostly who I've studied under. Um I, I've got some other, you know, people that I, I kind of follow a little bit, but I, as far as like one-on-one -on -one teachers, those are the ones that I've worked with most closely. Um, Dave Smith, who is, a uh, actually, uh, he's the one that actually started Wild Art Meditation Center, but, um, but you know, I, I'm always, uh, life is my teacher, right? Like if we get right down to it and like life is my teacher and, uh, to, to go back to what we were talking about, about, you know, really dwelling in the suffering is like. And then the whole, why would this happen to me? Is like I, the big thing that happened for me was the perspective shift of, the, of just taking everything as as a teaching moment, right? Like everything is a teacher, even the the worst moments of my life, there are lessons to be learned in those moments. And once we change that, our perspective to that, like what can I learn from this experience rather than woe is me, that, that's really when the doors open up. I mean, and you know, the Dharma doors are endless, so. Very well put. Now, uh, speaking of Dharma recovery groups, I guess I don't have to go into the drama of that. I haven't kept, I've heard just a little bit about it. And I've met mm -hmm. a, a couple of uh, Dharma friends um, 
uh, that that are in recovery too, and that are seeking out Dhamma recovery groups. Uh, would you mm-hmm. recommend? Uh, what, which ones can you recommend, or which just even name dropping any any ones that you know of for those out there who are listening to this that are in recovery uh, that could potentially be of help? And if you know how they differ well, from like twelve step programs too. Uh, okay, so you know, basically, um, I when I when I really started with uh, working with recovery uh, in in a like a, a dama fashion, it was through refuge recovery. Um, again, that was you know written by the book was written by Noah Levine, and that was kind of his uh, brainchild was uh, refuge recovery. And then uh, you know, for anybody who doesn't know, there was a, a bit of drama that happened about 2017, 2018. And then some of the, the the core people that were involved with refuge recovery kind of broke away from refuge and started what's called recovery dharma. And they're both excellent programs. Um, they differ from the twelve steps in the sense that they're they're well, they're not twelve step based, right? Like it's, uh, if we had to get, to, I mean, I guess you could call it twelve step based if we if we talk about four noble truths in an eightfold path, that's twelve, right? <laughs> but. But uh, you know, it's it's not quite the same thing. There there is an inventory that's involved with it, and there's some you know some work that. But it's really just using uh, Buddhist practice as as a pathway to recovery. Because if we really look at it, isn't the Dhamma really the world's oldest recovery program? If we're talking about freedom from craving, isn't wouldn't this be the world's oldest recovery program? <laughs> it's a good, well put there too. And I will just bring in clinging here too. You know. Um, Oh, yeah. When people yeah, yeah. talk about, um, you know, um, what, what is it? I, I heard somebody say that something like pleasure is not the problem. It's clinging. Clinging is the problem, right? Because we're all going to experience pleasure whether we want right. to or not. It's trying to hold it, on to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the one. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we got the opposite end where people get, um, the easier one to let go of is ill will because it just doesn't feel good. You know, that one feels horrible. When I finally started tuning into how horrible that feels in the body, it's it's an easier one to let go of. But the, the subtleties of uh, greed, uh, craving and clinging, they can, you know, for me now it'd be like information and, you know, I mean, even to, to spiritual practices sometimes. Right. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we can yeah. we can become attached to anything, right? Like, I mean, it's a very human thing to do. We are we are hardwired to seek out pleasure and to try to avoid pain. That's just what we do as 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 creatures. You know, like living on this earth, we that's what we do. It's it's programmed right into our DNA. So you know, what we're doing is essentially fighting against our own biology. Fighting's a bad word, but we're we're working against our own biology. So now what, uh, what experiences, if, as far as experiences, have you had, uh, lately? I thought I've, uh, saw some things where you've talked to some folks about psychedelics and whatnot, get your take on those as well. Um, retreats, you have any, re, uh, retreat experiences or retreats you're looking, f- um, forward to, to coming up and then just even new Dhamma teachings yeah, and um... new Dhamma discoveries. So let's see. So I guess we can start with psychedelics. I used to be very into uh, psychedelics. Um, I, I gained a lot of insight through psychedelic use uh, early in my life. And I really feel like um, psychedelics kind of opened the the pathway for me to be involved in the Dhamma at all. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I learned on psychedelics that I, I've also experienced on, and through meditation, right? And they'll both take you to the same place. But it's kind of like Ram Dass said, you know, it's like, you know, with psychedelics, you get to walk in the garden for a little while, but you always have to leave. With meditation, you kind of get to hang out there for as long as you want. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I did psychedelics for many years, and uh, I, I'm a, not against psychedelics. I, I feel like I, I've gotten the use out of them. You know, once you get the message, hang up the phone. Um, that's not to discount other people who, you know, still take part in psychedelics and, and find benefit from them. For me, it's just not where I'm at anymore. Um, retreats. Um, I try to sit as many retreats as I can. I'm, I'm actually in, I'm a 42 year old college student. So, uh, I don't get the opportunity to sit as many retreats as I would like anymore. Uh, I'm actually going to be signing up for a 10 day Vipassana retreat that I'm going to be doing over May after school lets out for the semester. So that I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. Uh, I've, I've always gotten a lot out of the Vipassana retreats, just the the sheer amount of practice that you're able to do over those 10 days really opens up the door to a, a lot of really 
interesting experiences. Um, uh, you know, working through progress of insight kind of in the Theravadan map. Uh, I've had some really interesting AMP experiences and, uh, where we left off at with these internet connection here is uh, we're talking about going on a 10 day Vipassana retreat. So pick up from there, please. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love the, uh, the 10 day Vipassanas, man. I think uh, what Goenka did was a wonderful thing. I don't know. I can't really think of anybody else that's done as much to spread the Dhamma other than the Buddha, than, than SN Goenka, quite honestly, you know, he's kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of the Dhamma, you know, with all these centers that he had, they're all over the world, you know, there's like over, 250 centers now and i'm still on my list to do one i um just didn't work out last time i had an opportunity oh. and what i found even super admirable about that is that they won't even accept donations until you've done a sit you've done a 10 yeah. day yeah, yeah. that's super cool yeah yeah no they, they want you to experience it you know and that's the you know it goes right back to what the buddha taught you know there's this word a hipposico come and see for yourself you know and uh, it, it's a wonderful place to, if you really want to do some deep work, go, go sit a 10 day Vipassana retreat because you have all the space and all the air and opportunity in the world to do all the practice you want to do. And um, you can really, really make a lot of progress. Quite, quite honestly, I saw more progress over the first 10 day Vipassana that I sat than I did over years of just practicing at home, you know, because I think, you know, it's, it's just that compounded practice. It's just so much at once. I've heard so many different takes from like the absolute worst thing someone's ever done to, you know, this is now a lifestyle. Like they go all over the world just volunteering and doing Goenka retreats, basically, you right. know, and uh, everything in between that. And I've even met someone that didn't even know anything about meditation, just jumped right into a 10 day retreat. And yeah, yeah. now they're, now they're um, on track to ordain, you know, uh, in, in a different tradition, though. But yeah, so uh, years later. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it is what you make it right. Like if you go into it and you're having a bad time and you just keep that mindset, you're going to have a bad time. I mean, it's, it's tough. It's, you know, it's like Buddhist boot camp, basically is what it is. You know, it's Dhamma jail. You're, you're it's, it's very much like being in jail is what it is. And so, but so, you know, I, having been to jail, like it, it was pretty easy for me. Like, it was like, all right, well, this is kind of cool. The food was way better. <laughs> There's like a condition of no escape set up and yeah, that's, it's at the same time, I imagine there's all kinds of like unspoken encouragement and the conditions are great. So it's, you can't really blame outside circumstances, at least in the immediate term, right? It's all the, the inner experience and yeah, uh, dredging up old stuff and experiences and probably physically endurance too for some folks, you yeah. know, yeah, working with pain and yeah, yeah. all kinds of things that can come up and uh, all the manner of hindrances that there are as well. Absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, the, the first one I did, I, I had this tremendous amount after about day four, I had uh, just this tremendous amount of hip pain. And, uh, and yet I don't know whether it was actually, maybe it was, uh, you know, a manifestation of trauma. You know, they, they say a lot of trauma is stored within the, the hips specifically. And, uh, yeah, it's a thing, you know, like it, stuff's going to show up, you know, it's once you, once you quiet everything down and you, you just sit with it, it's going to show up whether you like it or not. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Well, well, before we start winding this down, I wanted to get your take on, uh, insights on trauma because it seems like this is such a huge thing. I don't have um, trauma informed training or anything, but, you know, just having a, a human body is some degree of trauma. I kind of see it as a, a spectrum, right? Some people have had it really, really rough, lots of amount of trauma, but overall, what kind of wisdom do you have around this or how do you approach it? Or if people come to you or just anything in general to say about it, because I feel, uh, healing from trauma is so very important. And I, just don't know the all the best ways to go about it right so uh one of one of my one of my other teachers that i sit with pretty frequently is uh claude anshin thomas uh he's a, a zen practitioner he's uh started the zalto foundation he was ordained under bernie glassman and he uh, fortunately he lives like about an hour away from me and i go sit with him uh you know with a and not not as frequently as i would like to unfortunately with school and everything going on and you know just having homework and things of that nature but uh, he's a Vietnam veteran, and then uh, one of, one of the things that he, he that he said to me, and I think it was in one of his books, he wrote a book called At Hell's Gate, which is amazing. If it, if anyone wants to pick that up, I highly recommend it. Um, 
but he, there was this just one thing that he said, and it's a, you know, uh, everybody has their Vietnam, right? And it's like everybody, you know, you, whether you think you have trauma or not, there there is some experience in your life that has been not exactly fun for you, right? Like and maybe maybe that has left some sort of indelible imprint on you, and uh, it doesn't matter if you know somebody else has had it worse or if somebody else has had it better. Like that experience is yours, and if if it's terrible for you, it's terrible for you, and it's nobody's business to say, oh well, that's not that bad. Like you don't know their experience. And so I try to meet everyone with kind of that mindset, right? Like, I don't know what your experience is. No matter what the experience itself was, I don't know what your experience with it was. So, like, let's unpack that. You know, let's get to the root of that. And um, that's just the way I try to approach everybody, you know, just with, just with gentleness and with kindness. You know, we can come back to the Brahma Viharas again. You know, I try to just meet everybody with uh, kind friendliness, right? That's a really, uh, yeah, really good way to put it. You know, it just, it's kind of natural human tendency, um, to, to, to evaluate where someone's at in a way, but of course we never know where someone's at and it almost takes a training to see where, yes, there can be some discernment involved like, okay, well, if something, um, at least uh, compared to my own experience, when someone's telling me about their experience, right, to have it as a reference, go through my list of experiences as a reference point to where, you know, uh, as far as severity in my experience in order to know what kind of thing to do. But, you know, it just kind of comes through intuitively, but I like this notion of really honoring and respecting this, this huge uh, dignity we should have for everyone. And I think that's very good point because even just youngsters, you know, they can even just, just growing up, you know, some, there'll be certain experiences in certain age range, you know, that are challenging and even challenging, uh, ch challenging situations can be traumatic, uh, for folks. And I do find that very wise that there's a lot of wisdom in, and, in just honoring and respecting someone's journey for where they're at. And who am I to say that it, it it's super traumatic or not traumatic. It's just, right. uh, yeah, case by case basis, and I mean, yeah, who, it, it, who are we to say that it wasn't traumatic enough to be called trauma? You know, like we yeah, you don't know what yeah. you don't know how exactly. how how it met to, them. You don't know how exactly. what their experience with that was. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the situation was. It's 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 all about how they met their experience. Exactly. In, the, in that sense, it is, it's relative, and, but relative not in the sense that it's not important or valid or, um, you know, like to be blown off or, yeah, exactly. So yeah, the easy way to say it is, yes, the Brahma Viharas. Yeah. So, so Justin, uh, tell <laughs> folks come back to the where Viharas. you are at online. Um, uh, tell folks like the sitting groups that you're involved with, uh, that maybe mm -hmm. that you haven't mentioned or remind folks again, uh, tell folks about your podcast. If you have any other events coming up, uh, anything else you want to draw people's attention to. And then if you want to leave us with, uh, leave the audience with the last words, final message. Sure. Uh, so let's see, I, I am the, I guess you would call me the, uh, leading facilitator for, uh, uh, Gulf Coast Dharma here in Pensacola, Florida. It's a, just a local sitting group basically that I started a couple of years ago. Um, there was no Buddhist sitting group or Dhamma sitting group in this area. And I was looking for Sangha and I, I was like, well, the, uh, if I, if that's what I want, I'm just going to have to create it myself. So that's what I did. Uh, and we meet every Monday here in Pensacola at uh, 7 p.m. And uh, you can check out gulfcoastdharma.org. Uh, Dharma, not Dhamma. Um, I use Dharma because I feel like people know that word more th than they're going to recognize the Pali Dhamma, right? Uh, so gulfcoastdharma.org. Um, I also host the Dharma Junkie podcast. Uh, it can be found pretty much anywhere that podcasts are found. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Deezer, Stitcher, blah, 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 blah. Where, look it up. It's out there. I used to have a website for it, but I just don't care that much about having a website for it. It's out there. If you want to listen to it, it's there. Um, uh, final words. Uh, meditation and uh, daily life aren't separate things, right? Like, And here's a, something that I did kind of recently, and it's going to be more than just a few words, I guess. But um, I had a really dedicated sitting practice for years and years and years, and, I, and still do. Uh, you know, I was sitting an hour in the morning and an hour at night. Sometimes I would sit longer. Um, some days I would sit five, six hours. Um, 
and it became, it got to the point where it was kind of a really, what I would call a dry practice. Uh, and I was like, you know, I'm going to take a step back and really, you know, we can kind of go back to the name of your podcast, integrating presence, right? Like if you're not integrating into daily life, what are you doing? You know, mindfulness isn't just something we practice on the cushion. It's something that we live the, the Dhamma, uh, and it, it becomes our life, right? Like we, our life revolves around the Dharma. Like it's not just, we have this, people have this tendency to, to want to compartmentalize their spiritual practice. Like, oh, I'll, I'll live, I'll do my life here. And then I'll put my spiritual practice in this box over here. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Bring it in, bring it in, open it up, open your life up to the Dhamma, open the Dhamma up to your life and start really living by, you know, like what was taught in the Satipatthana, right? Like this is how we practice is like by bringing this presence, by bringing this stillness, by remembering to be present into everything that we do. Well, beautiful. Uh, thanks for that, Justin. And may all beings come to know their true nature and may all beings realize awakening and be free. Bye now. <laughs>